This KJZZ podcast series is supported by AARP Arizona, keeping Phoenix in motion with events to get out and do more things with your friends and family. Discover all the real possibilities here in the community on Facebook at AARP Arizona or aarp.org slash phoenix. This is The Recovering Caregiver. I'm Kathy Ritchie. I spent several years taking care of my own mom who had frontotemporal degeneration, a lesser known type of dementia. Her disease could manifest in the most excruciating ways. Behaviors like apathy, making inappropriate comments, or loss of inhibition are some of the hallmarks of FTD. So is loss of language. My mother eventually lost everything. She was no longer in control of herself. Her gray matter was being attacked and there was nothing I could do. Then, eight years after she started to change, she fell out of bed. That was the beginning of the end for her. It would be another two long, painful years before she died. There was a funeral. Friends and family came to say goodbye. Then, nothing. Everyone went back to their lives, and I was left to figure out mine. This is Life After Dementia, and I am a recovering caregiver. There have been a lot of stories lately about how millennials are becoming family caregivers. Thing is, younger caregivers aren't a new thing. We've been around for a while. I know this because I used to be one. People are just now paying closer attention. The two women you're going to meet in this episode were once younger caregivers, and that experience can now actually go on their resume. So I was in my 20s. I was in my uh, mid-20s. I was pregnant with my first and only kiddo, and I started talking to uh, who was the family caregiver at the time, my aunt out in Texas, and she was, you know, the primary caregiver for my grandmother. And the things she was saying about my grandmother and my conversations with her were just not right. They just didn't sound right. That's Suzette Armijo, and what was happening was her aunt was drinking heavily. So Suzette and her father made arrangements to bring her grandmother to Arizona. And then the whole caregiving situation became my life. But again, that wasn't the plan. It wasn't like, oh, my aunt is having trouble, can't handle it. We should move her here and then I'll be the primary caregiver and have this beautiful baby and still work. It wasn't planned out like that at all. A quick backstory about us. I met Suzette about 10 years ago. She had just started a support group for younger caregivers. At that time, there were very few places for me to go. The groups that were around were made up of mostly older spouses. Suzette wanted to fix what was clearly a big gap by getting me and others involved. So I had already been through the misdiagnosis and, or lack of uh, the fight for a diagnosis and then the, the fight for change and all of that. But I had gotten to a place where it was comfortable, even though it was horrible. It was comfortable. I knew what was going on. I knew what was happening. And um, and I felt good helping people. Like Sydney Peck, who we met through a mutual friend. Sydney, what about you? What, how old were you when things started to change with your dad? I was 27, so uh, almost 10 years ago now. And uh, my mother noticed it much earlier than I did because, of course, she lived with him and I was out of the home. But it was a Thanksgiving. And we were at my brother's house in Las Vegas. And it was a very specific situation where I asked my dad to do something. And he kind of looked at me super confused. We joked with each other a lot. And so I kind of jabbed at him. And then I watched my mom get really uncomfortable when I was jabbing at him because he didn't understand the joke. Um, And then I realized something was wrong and she pulled us aside and and said she believed he had um, early stages of Alzheimer's, which ended up he had uh, vascular dementia. But anyway, she started seeing that, um, started us on the long journey of misdiagnosis. But um, uh, then she became caregiver um, as the days got uh, longer and harder. And I would just make more and more frequent trips to Albuquerque um, from where I was living in Phoenix to support her. Dementia isn't in anyone's plans, and it certainly wasn't in Sydney's or Suzette's, but younger people are becoming caregivers. I won't say more and more because, like I said earlier, we've always been here. For me, the moment I realized something wasn't right was in 2004 or 2005, 
when I found a sample box of Aricept, a drug used to help slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease, on my mom's kitchen table. I was about to move back to New York, and I didn't want to believe it. It felt so unfair. In my head, I tried to explain away some of her behaviors that I had started to notice. That was the beginning of 10 years of my life that I hadn't planned on. Like Sydney and Suzette, I had dreams, goals, plans for my future, and caregiving wasn't on my vision board. But according to AARP, there are around 10 million millennials, people who are in their 20s and 30s, who are caregivers, and they're not always getting paid. And here's my issue with that. Sure, it sounds noble, and you might say, if not them, who? And that's true. Who? Hiring a full-time caregiver is expensive, which is why people choose to leave the workforce. But there are real consequences to that, like you're no longer contributing to your own social security, nor are you likely participating in a company retirement plan, and student loan debt is another big consideration. Younger caregivers can easily drown. Then there's the issue of rejoining the workforce after an extended absence. Leaving the workforce wasn't an option for Suzette or Sydney, so you do the best that you can with what you've got. You know, my skill set is in business and innovation. And so that's when I started, like every meeting I went to, every door that opened, I was learning that there were these little pockets of things happening in not just dementia related, but in, um, you know, the third third of life space of innovation. And so that's when I decided to found the Aging 2.0 local chapter that was an organi- a global organization out of San Francisco. Which gave entrepreneurs in the Valley a space to develop and share technology that could help older adults. Sydney will be the first to admit, this isn't the sexiest space for tech nerds like her to play in. But there's such a big market there and there's so much need. When you started like looking under things about what the aging population is using as their day-to-day tools, um, specifically in oh, the yeah. dementia or caregiving space, it was a joke. And so I started, you know, just looking around and what I ended up doing was taking a CEO position because, you know, I was still pretty green. I've never been a CEO before, but I knew business and I knew dementia. So did Suzette. She just didn't know it at the time. The recruiter that was helping me find a job after I had Giovanni, she was like, hey, check your email. I've got a place for you to go interview. And I looked and I was like, I don't know anything about geriatric care management or fiduciary work. I had honestly never even heard of the word fiduciary. Uh, When they said powers of attorney (laughs) and stuff, I'm like, oh, okay. I think I learned more in that interview than I, you know, it was very odd. But I got the job. And it was fantastic. And they told me, you know what, you, you've been there, you've done it, you're going to be relatable. I don't know if we're unique in that we all took our experience and did something with it professionally, but I do think it's gutsy. To quote Carrie Fisher, a.k.a. Princess Leia, take your broken heart and turn it into art. Suzette and Sydney and I don't have degrees in gerontology. We're not social workers. We just happen to be experts in a subject very few people want to be experts in. Who else gets this? Because people just don't. If you're not in it, you're not studying it. You have no idea. The average super educated, experienced person thinks that it's typical aging, right? Oh, yeah. Forgetfulness. Or, you know, they Mm -hmm. just don't get it. And so knowing that, just like you're saying with your story, it's a very specific skill set. And I felt compelled to to utilize it. And that's what I was trying to get to earlier. I forgot about that. Kathy, how many people came to us where they had been, I'm not going to name any places or doctors or anything. Um, I'm not trying to to hate on anyone, but they had been (laughs) to multiple doctors, multiple neurologists, multiple organizations, and didn't feel that they gave them all that they needed. There was a disconnect. I also felt dismissed a lot by organizations that were supposed to help caregivers like me. I remember once my mother had been asked to leave yet another facility. I had been volunteering for an Alzheimer's caregiver organization, and thinking I had allies there, I emailed two leaders for names of good facilities that might take my mom. They never replied. And then there were the doctors. I remember one neurologist was so rude to my mother and so dismissive. 
I even question my own assessment of her condition. Was I being crazy? Was I being overly dramatic? Well, that's probably because they didn't have a definitive answer to give yeah. you, regardless yeah. of what your experience was at home. Yeah, the, the comment a lot of times was like, eh, well, it's, it's, it's in the category of dementia. So like, right. do these things. Good luck. These things are be the things, instead of realizing the differences. And I think, you know, what I've come to learn is it's oftentimes, and there are definitely some experts who are formally trained who are brilliant in this space. Absolutely. But, but a lot of it is the firsthand caregiver experience is almost better than a medical degree. Do you ever think, like, I got to get out of this field? Only recently, as Kathy and I have, have talked about, not get out of the field, but um, all the additional uh, things that I did that were, like, therapeutic. It used to be so... Fulfilling, I think, is the word she's looking for. And I know this because I used to do those things, like volunteering and raising awareness for FTD and Alzheimer's disease with her. Suzette and I even formed a community support group. I felt like it was a therapy session, and I really loved it because I felt it was impactful. Not that I don't think it isn't impactful, but it's just not, it doesn't feel as therapeutic for yeah. me. So I'm at the space now where I feel like I'm pulling away from that. I think for me, I am I first did the dementia-related work because I did that as a tribute to my father. When I took a step back, one of the things that my dad would say to me all the time, and some of the words, so he lost language um, really, really early. And one of the phrases he was able to keep until almost the end uh, was, are you having fun? And that's what he would always say to me when he would see me. What a and good so one. when I got to that place in my business where I was not, um, and then I've had the opportunity to pursue a totally different career uh, where I would be, my thought was, okay, this is actually the legacy Right. Yeah. This is the tribute <laughs> to my dad is being really successful yeah. and loving what I do, not staying in the space just because he had dementia. In fact, he'd oh, be yeah. really pissed about that. I agree. My mom's been dead for almost five years. And the truth is, I don't talk about her very much. Those last few years were incredibly painful. And there are moments that have been seared with a branding iron on my brain and I don't have memories like Sydney. My mother's dementia snuck up on her, on me. And she never really had lucid moments along the way. She just vanished. A lot of my memories of our time together were somehow erased and replaced with what happened. But this project and what I do for a living in some ways lets me work through these emotional kinks because I still experience guilt and shame. So. The story in my head goes a little something like this. If I had only done this, that would be better. But if I'm going to be real honest with myself, my work in some ways is a form of penance because if I can give one person a tiny nugget of information that helps them along their journey, then that's time off for good behavior, so to speak. And people like Suzette and Sydney are still fighting for change in their own ways. I talked to Sydney after we did this interview, and even though she doesn't work in the aging field like Suzette, she's become a resource. She told me that friends and coworkers often refer her to those starting out on the caregiving journey. And while Suzette has stepped away from some of the extracurricular activities she used to participate in, she still networks and supports caregivers. Like Sydney, she's also become a resource. And maybe that's our purpose. After all, we were witnesses to one of the most horrible things that can happen to a family. And we come loaded with a lot of information about how the dementia and aging worlds work. For more about life after caregiving, including my conversation about dating after dementia, download more episodes at podcast.kjzz.org or on iTunes. I'm Kathy Ritchie, and thanks for listening to this episode of The Recovering Caregiver.